We'll start with an overview of nonparametrics and um, the second part will deal with nonparametric spatial covariance and then the third part will be Nancy's semi-parametric estimators. And what I'd like to do is set the stage by, um, if you're not familiar with this, which I'm assuming, if you are familiar with this, you're welcome to come and do the presentation for me, give me a break, <laughs> um, is two fundamental principles from nonparametrics. And these have to do with the estimation of a density function, which is a very simple thing, but it gets complicated when you move to the nonparametric world. And kernel regression, and that is an example of nonparametric regression. And I'll keep it very simple and just deal with respectively univariate and bivariate cases, but these are, can be and are generalized to multivariate settings. So first let's start with density estimation. And, and what is really the problem? The problem is one in which you have data and you're trying to get a mathematical summary of the distribution of the data. So we have um, observations on a variable or on multiple variables and we try to come up with an estimate of the density without assuming a functional form. Now I like to contrast this to the traditional approach. Traditional approach is say you assume a normal distribution, you take the data, you compute a mean, you compute a variance, then you plug these into the normal distribution and that gives you your, your nice bell shape for that mean and that variance. That is the traditional approach. A non-parametric approach does not assume a functional form. So it doesn't assume a bell shape. So the notions of the moments of a distribution, they're purely descriptive, but they don't really tell you anything about the full shape of the distribution. To characterize the full shape, you need a lot more information than just the mean and the variance. So density estimation is basically the stuff that you do automatically without thinking about it, constructing histograms and constructing smooth histograms or density functions from the data. These are very basic descriptive statistics, but the methodology behind them is really the core, the fundamentals of nonparametrics. So first let's think about what a density function really is, and then we'll see how we can actually estimate a density function from data. So we start with the abstract concept, purely mathematical formulation, where we have a cumulative distribution function, this capital F, and the density is simply the, the slope of the cumulative density function, distribution function, or the derivative of it. So the derivative, if you remember your calculus, high school calculus, we put the, fun the definition of it here explicitly, so it's really a limit as we go to zero of the difference between the f value of the function at two points very slightly apart. So we'll use this in the next step to operationalize this. So formally the density function is can be thought of as the limit as the interval becomes very very small of the probability that the a given observation value is within a given interval. So in a discrete distribution, we just count them. Right. In a continuous distribution, technically the probability that we observe a given value is zero because it's a continuous distribution. So we have to use an, a different way to think about it and we think about this as very small intervals. So in very small intervals, conceptually, we're just counting how many observations are in this tiny, tiny interval, and in the limit that gives us the slope of the curve, or what we call the density function. Okay, so then, that is the concept. How do we approximate this with real data? The principle is very simple. We will operationalize what we mean by this interval. So we will create a little band, if you wish, or a little bin, and then start counting. It's as simple as that. So the histogram is a discrete approximation of this, which is um, a step function, if you wish, 
uh, which takes this definition and makes it discrete. So rather than a, a limit to zero, we simply estimate the fraction of the data that is for each i, for each observation, the fraction that is in a given interval. So you can think of it two ways. You can think of it as the observations and where do they fall, or you can think of it as moving along the x-axis in different intervals and just seeing how many observations are in that given interval. And the height of the bar gives you a measure of how many there are. And now histograms, you can either use the complete count as the value for the bar, or you can rescale it, which is what we do here, by dividing it by the total number of observations. We, in fact, show the fraction of the observations that are in that interval. So then it becomes compatible with the notion of a density function. It gives you, if you wish, the probability that any value falls in that particular interval. So this is readily um, implemented by just counting. You, know, you just move along the x-axis and count how many observations are in that inter interval and then make a bar. That's it. Another way to represent this, and one that will be useful later on, is to use an indicator function. And the indicator function, it's kind of hard to see in the notation here, is this i, which is a way of expressing whether or not the condition in parentheses holds. So when the condition in parentheses holds, we count 1. When it doesn't hold, we don't count it. So the interval, if you look at it carefully, the fact that xi is within x0 minus h and x0 plus h, so that's really a band around x0, is the same as saying that the difference between xi and x0 divided by h is less than 1. Or I skipped a step that the difference between xi and x0 is less than h, or then if you divide by h, you standardize it up to 1. And this will be useful later on when we generalize this to kernel functions. So at this point, what we have is a simple approach where we sum for each of the observations. We'll look at the difference with a given benchmark point. And obviously, this is not how we do it. It's, this is kind of the hard way to do it for each observation. We're looking at the benchmark point, point. Is it within the benchmark point? Yes, we count it. No, we don't. Then we take the next observation, do this again. Then we get another benchmark point, because the x0 is just the benchmark where we graph the function and do the whole thing over again. So we don't really do this in practice. In practice, we do it the other way around. Set the benchmark points and just count how many are in the interval. We don't actually loop over i for each benchmark point. Okay. But we loop over the benchmark points for the i's. In the end, it doesn't really matter how we approach it, we get something like this, which is um, the histogram for the Columbus crime data, which we all know and love, and um, using seven bits. And what I wanted to point to is the sensitivity, and this is something most of you are probably familiar with, the sensitivity of this graph as a summary of the distribution to the choice of the bin. So if we increase the bin size, say we have only four, this is a, a totally different sense of the distribution that you get relative to the previous one. See, the previous one we have, if you wish, kind of a bimodal thing, almost. In the next one, the bimodal is completely gone. And then if you go even further and do the opposite, 20 bins, then you see there's, you know, this becomes almost uninformative. There isn't really any structure in this. So the histogram is a discrete approximation. It counts, it simply counts the number of times observations fall in a given bin. We want to extend this and get an estimate of the density function that's closer to a continuous value. And how we're going to do this is by not just counting 
values in the bin equally, but weighting them. Specifically, in the so-called kernel density estimation, what we do is we use the same approach. So we have the xi minus x0 divided by h. We used to have this indicator function. Now, instead of the indicator function, which simply says yes, 1, no, 0, we give a weight. And the weight is given through this k function. So these uh, rescale distances go into the function, are an argument to the function. And the function is something that is very similar to actually a density function itself, in that it gives decreasing weights as you move away from the reference point. So in other words, the, the, the observations closer to x0 are counted more than the ones further away. So rather than counting everything equally, you're counting the closer ones more, and this gives you a smoother approximation to the density function. Because you can, using this function, you can move this over the x-axis and do this counting at every point in the x-axis. And because you are in the extreme, you can take the whole distribution into account, depending on how far your kernel goes, you get a very smooth estimate of the density function. The importance here is what is this k? What is the function that gives the weights? And we already have the, the essential idea is that it gives weights that decrease as in distance increases. And there are several uh, examples in the function, specific examples. The general characteristics of this weight function are that it is symmetric. So it works the same both directions away from the reference point. Uh, it's continuous, it integrates to 1, so it's just like a weighting function where the weights, when added up, give you the total, so it's, in a sense, a weighted average. The integration to 1 guarantees that it is a weighted average. It's positive, there is a requirement that it decreases with distance, but there are two ways to implement this. With, one is where there is actually a cutoff, so that the kernel is actually zero for distances larger than a given reference distance. And so you have this reference distance is the bandwidth, if you wish. For anything beyond the bandwidth, the observations are no longer counted. So that is, you can think of a tenth function, something that decreases linear with distance, and then it stops, zero beyond that. That's the most common form. The other form is one where that's not the case, but there is some counterpart to this, and it, formally it's put as the product of z with the kernel function goes to zero as the distance increases. So in other words, the kernel function has to go to zero fast enough so that it compensate for this distance going to infinity. So the distance is getting larger and larger, so multiplied with this function, we have to make sure that the combined effect goes to zero. So in effect, what this means is that we have a distribution function that tails towards zero in the limit. So it doesn't have a, the same kind of cutoff as the other one does, but it has, if you wish, a practical cutoff, where for all practical purposes, the difference between the k function and zero is so small that in effect it is a cutoff. So this is the major distinction between two, qualitative distinction between two types of kernel functions, one being the one with the absolute cutoff, the other one has a smooth decay and has what I call a practical cutoff, but not an, a, a, a discrete one as the previous one. So a number of functions in fact, a large number of functions satisfy this requirement. Some examples here that you may see in the literature, uh, I've given them here without their normalizing constants. They all have, strictly speaking, a normalizing constant to ensure that the integration sums to 1. Okay, But you get the idea of the functional form here. The first one, the triangular one, is what I call this tenth function. So basically we have 
a linear decay with distance, 1 minus z, uh, always absolute value because it works both ways in, the, in, in either direction. The others are just manipulations of this where the decay is faster with the distance than a linear decay. You have various power functions, square, uh, third power, there's all kinds of fancy ones. Essentially what they're trying to capture is different speeds, if you wish, of the distance decay. So the linear is a reference point and then all the other ones go faster to zero than the linear. The Gaussian is an example of one with an infinite range because it's a bell shape, so it doesn't have a, an, an actual bandwidth cutoff. In, the, in, in practice, you are, when you use these functions, you are asked for a bandwidth for the normal distribution or the Gaussian kernel that isn't, in fact, a true cutoff, but it is the counterpart of a variance or a standard deviation. So if you give the standard deviation for the bell shape, that determines how quickly it, it starts to move to zero. So the, the larger the variance, the flatter it is, the narrower the variance, the steeper it is, so the faster it goes. And, you know, the faster it becomes zero for all practical purposes. This is this practical cutoff. So these are a number of these um, kernel functions, and then you implement this by... Um, using this weighted moving average, if you wish, where uh, one way to think about this is at each reference point, as you move across the x-axis, you take all the values, this is univariant, right? You take all the values that you observe and you weigh them by the kernel function. So you start, say, at point 1, you take the observations that are close to 1, they get a high weight as you move further and further away from 1, they get a lesser and lesser weight. Once you reach the bandwidth, it stops. They're not counted anymore. So then you move a little further, say you move to 2, and you start the whole process over again. So you can think of this as moving curves on top of each other. This is often the way it's shown in textbooks. And then you add them all up, and the sum of all of them is the overall kernel density function that um, approximates the smooth density function. This is not as easy as it sounds. Um, there's two major issues that you have to deal with in practice. One is the kernel function itself. The second one, more importantly, is the bandwidth for the kernel function. So the kernel function is just whether we take Bartlett weights or Eponechnikov or the Gaussian or one of those things. Primarily the qualitative, um, the qualitative choices involved are whether we have an absolute cutoff or not and how fast we go to the cutoff. And so that is a choice between, say, linear decay and then higher powers, which are faster uh, cutoffs. In practice, as it um, turns out, and there's a large body of literature on this, the choice of the kernel function is not the most important thing. The choice of the bandwidth is much more important. And I'll show you in a minute some examples of how much that actually matters you can think of the bandwidth in intuitive perf terms. If it's too large, then in fact you're counting all the observations all the time. The result is too smooth an estimate. If you make the bandwidth too small, it's too spiky. It's very local. So then you have a very spiky estimate. Now, what are the trade-offs between these two? Essentially, it becomes a trade-off between bias and variance. And this is, um, I won't get into the technical details, this is very formal. Assuming you know what the underlining conditional uh, density function is. How good is this kernel as an approximation of the true density function? And so if on average it's on target, then it's unbiased. The spread around this mean is the variance. The different choices of a bandwidth result in, you, know, I d you can think of it, if your bandwidth is the smallest possible, then you're always on target. At each individual location, you're right there. As your bandwidth increases, you're off a little bit. But then, because it's smoother, there's less variability. So these two are the trade-offs involved, and there's some objective functions 
used in the non-parametric literature that combine these two. They're kind of the equivalent of mean squared error, something that combines the bias with, with the variance. And then there is a whole literature on what is the optimal bandwidth. And, and the way to think about this is if you have made certain assumptions about the distribution, and typically this is done in the context of a normal distribution, then you can derive formally what these trade-offs are between bias and variance. And then you can minimize, if you wish, the objective function such that you have the best fit in terms of bias and the smallest variance for that fit in terms of variance. And so there are several treatments that do this and they come up with an optimal bandwidth which is a function typically of the variance of the data, the empirical variance of the data or the interquartile range or something similar to that. So you take your data, you compute the inter interquartile range then you plug this in, this equation, that's why it's called a plug-in estimator, and out comes the optimal bandwidth. So say um, a lot of software implements this directly, doesn't even give you a choice. So you say, I want a density function, out comes this thing, and it uses a plug-in estimate for the bandwidth. That's not necessarily the best way to go because different objective functions will give you different optimal bandwidths. And so it really depends in the end on what it is you're trying to see in the data. And we'll have some examples of that, some illustrations this afternoon in the semi-parametric work. So basically then, given this, we can um, apply this again to the Columbus data. And what I've done here is superimpose the histogram on three different uh, kernel density estimates. The one using the optimal bandwidth from the plug-in estimator is the dark one, this one. So you see it has a bump here, then another little bump there, which are you know, similar to the bumps that we had in our histogram, but much smoother. When you increase the bandwidth, this is often referred to as, in a negative sense, as over-smoothing so you make it too smooth, then you lose information about the particular features of the distribution. Remember why we do this in the first place. We do this because the parametric approach is in some sense too stylized. It makes the distribution too nice. And we're interested in features of the distribution that may be different from the stylized, say, bell shape. Particularly we're interested in asymmetries, we're interested in outliers, we're interested in particular bimodal features or multimodal features, bumps in the distribution, which the parametric approach tends to hide. And, and let me relate this to something we talked about a lot last week, spatial heterogeneity. Spatial heterogeneity is an example of mixing of distributions. For example, if you have a census tract with both very high income uh, population and very low income population, and you get the median income or the mean income, that is a mean from combining highs and lows, but there basically is nobody that corresponds to that mean. And this is what you often get in a parametric situation. You would just take the average of the incomes, you would take the standard deviation, which may be fairly large, but still the picture will be a unimodal distribution, which completely hides the fact that there may be two modes. In non-parametrics, because you don't force this functional form on the data, you let the data suggest that maybe this is a mixing of two populations. And the data will bring that out if it comes out with two bumps in the density function, which suggests a bimodal distribution. And one way to get a bimodal distribution is from mixing two separate distributions, that each with their own characteristics. So that's why we don't want to oversmooth. Oversmoothing, and that's why oversmoothing is a bad thing, because it hides, it tends to hide these features from the data. And if you look carefully at the red function, you see it's very smooth and there is 
very little to no suggestion of a bump in the data. You know, if, if you can see it in the back, there, there is no bump um, like we have in the black function. In the black function, we have this other little thing here. The red one goes straight down, is very smooth. So the red one, in fact, hides that feature from the data. On the other hand, the spiky one, which is the one with the short bandwidth, is not informative in another direction in that there's too much variability. There are too many spikes in here. You know, we, we don't just have the two bumps, but we have three major bumps and then a couple of little bumps and then an outlier here. So that tends to be referred to as under smoothing. There isn't enough smoothing in that too many individual features of the data are too prominent. And the ideal in kernel density estimation is to achieve some kind of a compromise between hiding all the individual features, which is what happens if you oversmooth, and having them to be being too prominent, which is what happens if you undersmooth. So in a nutshell then, kernel density estimation is, you, know, you might have never thought about this, but you've probably done it your whole career, is in a way to come up with a smooth, continuous estimate of the underlying density of the data. As I mentioned yesterday, the density itself is something that we do not observe. We don't know what it is. It's just like an error term. It's a concept. We don't actually see it. This is an estimate for it. So in practice, you never know whether this is a good estimate or a bad estimate. The only way you know is if you fake it, if you simulate the data, and if you then check how well your kernel density does. So this is very similar to working with residuals and taking the residuals as estimates for the error term. We never really know what the error term is because we can't observe it. So similarly, we don't really know what the density function is, but this is an estimate of the density function that we obtain with as little assumptions as possible. The key here is that you let the data speak, so for the data to speak, they have to be good data. This is often forgotten. So you need a lot of information to get a good estimate of the density function. Would you test this by repeated sampling or out of sample? It, it doesn't really get tested. It's, uh, the question is, do you test this by out of sample fit? Uh, you can, but then the question is, is the, how do you interpret it? Because one way to interpret it is that the out-of-sample data do not belong to the same density function. This is the way you think about outliers. <laughs> if you observe outliers, there's two, two ways to approach outliers. One is to say, well, the outlier doesn't belong in the rest of the distribution, so I throw it out. The other one is to say it's a feature of the distribution that just has thick tails. It has extreme observations. And so when you do out of sample fitting, if you wish, it's the same question. You know, is this, does it not fit because it doesn't belong or does it not fit because our density estimate is not good to begin with? The, um, it's an art as much as a science. I mean, if you want to go the science route, you use the plug-in bandwidth and nobody's ever, ever going to question it. But this is very much a function of the objective function that is chosen. Your objective function may have a difference trade-off between variance and bias. And so it's always important to remember this, uh, to put it in a different context. We tend to be so fixated on minima minimizing a sum of squares. But that's only one of a number of possible criteria we could use. We could lo you look at absolute differences. Uh, we could look at particular quantiles in the distribution. And these are all different objective functions which will give us different estimators. It's the same here. Uh, the most common one in the literature, and it is based on reference to the normal distribution. When the distribution is not normal, um, it's not as clear what is the optimal bandwidth because we don't really know what the true underlying density is. So, I mean, the only way you get these clear functions is because you cheat. Now, if you say, if it is normal, then I know how close I get to the normal. Then I know what bandwidth I need to take 
to minimize the combined bias and, and variance. But if you don't know what it is in the first place, there is no way that you can check that in fact you're doing well or doing better than you could. So keep that in mind with these automatic um, optimal bandwidth criteria. There are only a guidance and, and actually if you look at the textbooks about this, the advice they give you is to try multiple bandwidths because they reveal and patterns in the data and then it's up to you to decide do you really care about these three extra bumps or is that something that is just a feature of having too small a bandwidth and it's really too much detail and that's really up to you to vary the bandwidth and see how the estimate of the density function changes as you vary the bandwidth and starts to hide certain features of the data or bring out certain features of the data and the ultimate goal is always to what extent is this one distribution? I, I mean, in terms of the econometrics, in, sp in terms of the spatial regression, we're always very concerned if we're applying techniques to multimodal distributions or to mixtures of distributions, because that's trouble. Okay. Then we can move forward with the same... Co yeah. Well, you, you could use this, uh, the, the question is, can you use simulation to do an assessment of this? You could use this to see, for example, look at how different optimal bandwidth rules work and how they perform. You know, rather than, say, taking a, 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 an analytical approach, which is the textbook case, you could take a more empirical approach. The other a aspect I should uh, stress is that don't overdo this. This is univariate, it's not multi, I mean you can extend it to multivariate of course, but, and in fact this is one of the hot areas in data mining, is to get multivariate kernel density estimates. So in other words, when you have, it's kind of hard to visualize, I, I'm, I can handle 3D, but you know, 20D, that becomes kind of hard, but basically you have a 20 dimensional data space and you're looking for bumps in the data space or interesting features of that data space by smoothing over the 20 dimensions. And, and that becomes a highly computationally intensive uh, uh, affair. And if you look at the literature, there's some really interesting stuff in computation on how to actually do this uh, efficiently and quickly. So. Their summaries of the distribution, they give us an idea of the extent to which our usual assumptions about unimodal symmetry, those kinds of things are reflected in the data. But the more interesting aspect is how this idea, this univariate idea, so far we just deal with one variable at a time, can be extended into first a bivariate and then a multivariate context. And so in a univariate, we're just interested in the overall density, in the bivariate context, and also the multivariate context, we're interested in modeling the conditional mean. A regression, in essence, is a model for the conditional expectation of the dependent variable given a value for the explanatory variable. And a linear regression just forces this to be a linear function. But in general, we can think of this as a general unspecified function g, of the x's so that given x what on average would y be that's really what it's about so if you have a relationship between crime and income and I give you an income level on average what would the crime rate be that's really what it's about so in a linear regression we force this relationship to be a linear function so this is uh, some of you have seen this a lot is a linear regression of crime in Columbus on income. 
So instead of having a univariate distribution across a single dimension, we now have two dimensions. We have the income as the horizontal axis and the crime as the vertical axis. These are, this is the scatter plot, if you wish. So for each x, we can ask the question, what on average would y be? And the regression function tells us that on average this is the crime rate that we can expect. But by looking at this curve, particularly in this range here, you see that there is quite a range of y's for very small changes in the x. So then the question is, how do we best model this? You also see that, well, maybe you don't, but that the range, the vertical range, kind of changes as we move along the x-axis. So the linear approximation of this conditional mean may not be that great. Not only is there spread around the mean, but there might also be a change in the slope as we move through the data. And so this, again, is where the non-parametric perspective comes in, in that rather than forcing a given functional form, we let the data give us the functional form. And we let the data give us a functional form by, in essence, estimating a local slope at each possible x value. So rather than forcing the same slope on all the x values, which is what we do in a linear model, we let the slope change as the x value changes. And the idea we use to get there is very similar to what we did in the univariate case. In the univariate case, in order to get an estimate of the density function, we took bins and counted the number of observations that fell into these bins and went from a simple unweighted count in the histogram to a weighted count using a kernel function to get the weights. And we'll use a similar rationale here, but now we're in bivariate situation. So we're interested in finding the conditional mean, which is the average of the dependent variable given a value for the explanatory variable. Now think of the case where we only have a small number of discrete values for x. So this is the case in which your scatter plot would be a bunch of vertical dots, one um, line corresponding to each value of the x. So typically in, in medical analysis, you have a number of treatments, a number of doses, a dosage one, two, three, and then if you have for each of these dosages, you have a number of responses. What is the mean, the conditional mean, given dosage 1? It's the average of the y's for that 1. That's the most reasonable estimate. What is the conditional mean for dosage equal to 2? It's the average of the y's corresponding to the vertical line for 2, and so on. So for each discrete value, the conditional mean is very simply the average of the y values that we get for that x value. We have a finite number of discrete values for x. So for each of these, you can think of these as almost like bins, but they're bins of width zero. They can correspond to one value and one value only. For each of these, you just take the average of the y's. Now we start extending this notion to situations where we have a continuous distribution for the x values. And then the notion of doing this for each individual x doesn't work anymore because there will be situations where there just simply isn't enough information on the y-axis to compute a mean. You may just have one point. So rather than doing it that way, we again take a bin around each of the possible x values and then compute a local average of the y's. So now you can think of a histogram-like approach where you take a number of bins, and in each of the bins, you take the average of the y's. And that is another estimate for the conditional mean, now obtained by taking a bin. But it's a still discrete. It's still a step function. Then you can refine that more, and you see where I'm going. And it's rather than just simply counting the y's in each bin, you take a weighted average of the y's in each bin. And then the next step 
is to use a kernel weight to get at the weighted average and then we can apply this rather than thinking about it as bin we can apply this as moving over the whole x-axis and then com computing this for each um, reference point really so we go from the local average to the so-called <laughs> kernel regression we we think of it first as giving equal weight so what we're doing here is we sum over all the observations all the x's and it, it takes a little getting used to on what exactly is going on here this is a computation of the conditional mean for x equal x naught so this is for a given point on the x-axis what is the expected mean for or the expected value for y given the x value so we go in concept we don't actually do this we consider each observation in turn we look at how far that observation xi is from x naught our reference point as long as it is within the bandwidth h we count it meaning that the indicator of that function here i of the difference between xi and x naught divided by h less than one becomes a one which means that we count the y and in the denominator we also count one so then we go to the next i we look at its difference from x naught if it is within the range we count the y and then in the denominator we add one to this so in essence what we're doing here is counting the number of times there is an xi within h from our reference point point and for those cases we take the average of the y's the average because we have the number accumulated here in the denominator of how many there are so in essence this is what I just um, described is we have these we pick a reference point x naught we put this band around it plus or minus h we can think of this as a bin we count all the y's in there and we take their average then we take another reference point and we repeat the whole procedure so for each possible reference point we can compute what this expected value of y might be and the finer grained our reference points are the closer this estimate will be to a continuous function so if we make it this is nothing to do with the bandwidth this has to do with how often we evaluate this for x naught so if we take the x naughts very close to each other for each of these we will we'll have an estimate of the average y's and that will, will then become a smooth function if we take them far apart if we take very few of them it will be a jagged function it won't be very smooth and then the next step is in the same rationale we so the the rationale is that we take reference points and compute this average for each reference point then the kernel regression is to do this but instead of simply averaging them taking a weighted average where we no longer have an indicator function i but we now have a kernel function k so rather than taking a straight average of the y's we take a weighted average of the y's where the y's that are for for x's that are closest to x naught get more weight than the y's for x x's that are further from x naught and that is then called a kernel regression so it's the notion that regression is really about modeling the conditional mean given x on average what would y be that is what it's about so then rather than forcing that to be constant which is the case in a linear regression we let it vary and we let it vary in a smooth fashion with the data by using this weighted average of the y's in a band close to the x for which we're interested in getting the expected mean.
So it's a slightly different way of thinking than what we're used to in regression, but that's really what regression is. Regression is a model for the conditional mean. And we tend to focus on the betas and how you get the betas, but really the interpretation here is what does X tell me about Y? Which is really what the conditioning is about. The conditioning gives us information. We get information about the income. What does that tell us about the crime rate that we might expect? Rather than focusing on the betas. So then if you implement this, um, you have the same issues as you have in the univariate case. Again, we have to choose the kernel function, as it turns out the sensitivity of the results to that is not that great. We have to choose the bandwidth, which is very important. And then um, we can carry out all kinds of inference in terms of how significant is the slope and things like that. Um, how imp uh, significant is the change in the slope. And I want to mention this because this ties in to something we discussed last week when we talked about geographically weighted regression. It is the same general idea in that you have a varying slope as you move through the data and the properties of the estimator come from infill. And, but this is infill in variable space, not in geographic space. So you can think of the, the data points. If the data points are very sparse, then you don't have a lot of information about local change. As the data points get denser and denser, you get better and better information about local change. So your estimate of your kernel regression, which is the conditional mean, gets better and better. And so there's, a, the, again, the um, properties are based on asymptotics. We don't tend to think about this because this is very easy to implement. But in order to know that your estimate is actually a good estimate and approaches the true conditional mean in the limit, you have, there's a lot of mathematics behind this that I won't get into. So with uh, geographically weighted regression, um, the, the main difference is we're using a lag instead of a kernel? No, you're also using a kernel, but the difference is that the, the, the let me uh, go back one slide. See, in the kernel, the distance, if you wish, is between values of the explanatory variable. In GWR, the distance is between locations. And so you take the observations for locations that are close, and then you run the regression on that subset, which, where the, the infill, if you wish, the asymptotics, come from getting more and more points in space. As you get more and more points in space, the estimate of the slope gets to be a better and better estimate. In the origins of this, the space that matters is not geographic space, but is the variable space here, the attribute space. So as you get more and more points along the x-axis, so to, uh, to speak, denser and denser, you get a better and better approximation of the true function. Just as in, in GWR, as you get more and more data points in geographic space, you get a better and better approximation of the continuous change of the parameters. So does the output generate a set of betas, or does it just generate the yi's? Predictable. This is the output. The output generates a, a, a visual representation of the conditional mean. <coughs> So there's no betas involved because the betas are tied to a linear functional form. So you, there are no parameters. You get the functional form from looking at it. There's no equation. It's just the, yeah, the, well, they're not actually, they're, they're the conditional means. So they're the average y's given x. So here again, I gave you uh, three examples. The little, the, the dashed line is the, the reference is the linear regression. And let's see. The blue one is the one using an optimal bandwidth. So what you see in the blue one is some 
nonlinearity here. So at the small range of income, we have a positive relationship between crime and income. So at the low income range, as income goes up, crime goes up. And then it reaches a point, kind of around here, and then it goes down pretty much with crime. And then there is another kind of change in slope. Here it's fairly steep, and then here it kind of flattens out again. That's the optimal one. Now, when you over smooth, and so you crank up the bandwidth, then you see that, and I only show you one example, but you can actually run this multiple times. What you see is that this part of the curve starts to bend up. And this red one is an over smoothing, an over smooth one. And if you go to the extreme, and make the bandwidth infinitely large, you end up with a linear function again. Because the linear smoother is one that gives equal weight to all the data everywhere. So you take the same data set at no matter where you are in the X range, and the same slope estimate no matter where you are in the X range. So you get the same result by cranking up the bandwidth now, depending on the function, on the kernel that you use, it's going to happen faster or slower. But you can see, you can get some sense of this by comparing the blue line to this red line, which is really, you know, this has been pushed up closer and closer to the linear function, and, and the same happens at the other end. And then the really jagged one is the one with a very small bandwidth, where again, we have, in a sense, too much detail too much suggestion of changes in the data, of local changes in the data. But you could argue that the red line is better because the blue line is so sensitive to a couple outliers at the beginning of the work. Well, I mean, that's the whole point of how do you interpret the outlying values. I mean, kernel functions and any smoother is sensitive to boundary effects. So in any case, at the very low end and at the very high end, there will be weird things happen because the range you know we take the bandwidth h on each side but if we're at the end then only half of it counts so to speak so that that is a feature of um, kernel smoothing and then different software packages deal with this in in different ways and they compensate for the edge effects like you can compensate for edge effects and you know point pattern analysis and things like that. It's th the same idea, yeah. Uh, you put the uh, uh, volatile residuals of the blue line in the kernel. Do you see that it's not uh, symmetric? It could be a problem with the, the estimation. Because the, 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 the curves don't pass you between the, the points near the well, th yeah, the question is, if you would plot the residuals, that they would not be symmetric. And, in fact, that is because you're using a different objective function. If you use a least squares type of objective function, you want the residuals to be symmetric. In fact, they are by construction. If you use other objective functions, there's no reason why they should be. You know, if you don't care about, I mean, symmetry of the residuals is about bias lack of bias. And so here you have a trade-off. There is some bias, obviously, and the bias is not the same everywhere in the data either. So you have a trade-off between the bias and the variability around it. The, the point, the, you can think of the extreme situation where each individual data point is its own point on the function. Then there is no bias whatsoever. But it's also not informative because there is no generalization going on. So anytime there's generalization going on, you will have some bias, but then you trade that off. If you have each, for example, the spiky one has less bias because it's closer to the points, but it's more variable, so you get more variance. The, the over smooth one has more bias, but it has less variance. 
the objective function is one that combines these two criteria in some optimal fashion. And so with the optimal bandwidth, you get some compromise. And in this case, the optimal bandwidth shows this kind of bump, which could be argued is due to edge effects, <coughs> or maybe not. But the difference between this and a linear regression is that it does suggest these things. And in fact, in, in another one, um, this is running ahead. If you apply this to, say, a Moran scatter plot, you can interpret this as possible changes in the spatial autocorrelation in the data. And if you do this for Columbus, you can see that there is a clear bump. In, I mean, depending on, on you know, pretty much any bandwidth, you see a bump in the slope. So the, the, Moran, the Moran scatter plot and the slope of it is Moran's eye, which is a linear smoother through these points. If you put a kernel sm smoother through the points, you can see a bump in the function, which suggests that in one part of the data, there is stronger spatial autocorrelation than in another part of the data. And if you select these points, as it turns out, I mean, this is a fluke, of course. There's no generality to this whatsoever. But they correspond to distinct sub-areas in the city. The core is very highly spatially correlated. The periphery is not, for all practical purposes. And this kind of thing you don't get when you use a linear function, or any other parametric function for that matter, which imposes a priori what the functional form would be. Remember, the, the, the main interest here is saying something about a dependent variable conditional upon the explanatory variable. So give me an income. What can I expect in terms of crime rate? So could you tell me how this then compares to using a quadratic function in your converting income to income squared or something like this in your linear regression? Can you use this information to move back to linear format? Is the right? question is, can you use this to move back to linear format or quadratic format? Or um, a polynomial regression, in fact, is one way, an, another alternative way to get a non-parametric regression. The kernel one just uses this kernel smoother to get the averages. Another way to approach it is to fit, you know, a fifth order or sixth order polynomial through here, which will also get you uh, some detail, more detail than a linear function. The difference, the, the fundamental difference between the two is that the kernel does not force any functional form on you. Whereas if you assume a polynomial, even though high order polynomials subsume a lot of functional forms in them, it's still a little more parametric than this. This is purely data, only data. There's no, nothing else that drives the functional form. So it's a, yeah. Yes, so the question is what happens if you have more variables? The, this, as I mentioned, I've kept it simple. So we did univariate density first with the histogram and the kernel density function, and bivariate, in this case, with the bivariate kernel. Because I find it, it's more intuitive to get the idea when you just keep it simple to the bivariate case. The more interesting approach is, of course, is when you extend this to multivariate cases. And then in 3D, you can think of bumps in 3D surfaces, 4D, 5D, 6D, you know. But again, kernel density estimation in, is a major application in data mining. What happens to the conditional mean if I have this combination of X variables? And particularly, how does the conditional mean change when I change things in the explanatory variables? Yes, so that's you want different kernel functions in different variables. <laughs> yeah, or you can multi there's there's multivariate kernel functions like a multivariate normal, or there are products of